It's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Lili Rani from the University of California, San Diego, to give this talk for us today, sponsored by the Center for Digital Culture and the Digital Futures Institute. Um, Lili Rani holds many different positions at San Diego. She is in the Department of Communication Studies and Science Studies and the Design Lab and the Institution for Political and Pr Practical Ethics and in Critical Gender Studies. Now, this may seem like an eclectic set of appointments, and indeed it is, because Lily's work itself is quite eclectic. I first encountered her work um, through the subject of this talk, through a paper that she had published um, on Amazon Mechanical Turk workers and the tools that they had built to help with organizing in those settings. But then I found the work that she had also written on post-colonial computing, which has now become a touchstone if people are thinking about post-colonialism in relation to technology and computing in particular. And then I went on to find that, in fact, that he did not stop there. She has her award-winning book, Chasing Innovation, which offers a very thoughtful critique of the connection between notions of innovation and development. Now, how is it that all of these different um, intellectual projects can find their home in one person? And most people you might look at this and say, well, this is simply eclecticism, they're moving across many fields. But at the core of Professor Irani's work is a concern for forming a very thoughtful critique of capitalism and of colonialism. And not stopping at that critique, but rather forcing us to confront notions of praxis. How do we then resist these systems? How do we organize? How do we build new technologies? How can we reimagine a world right, in which we can actively challenge these systems rather than merely forming a critique. And indeed, the talk today is very much in that vein, showing us how we can start to think about approaching, critiquing, and eventually transforming these systems that are starting to shape all of our worlds. And with that, I'll hand over to Lily. Thank you, so thank you so much for being here today, and thank you for that amazing introduction, Ashwin. Um, the talk that I'm going to present today very much does connect some of the different projects that Ashwin was talking about in terms of understanding surveillance and uh, the ways that surveillance of different groups of people, uh, in this case, impacts workers who are all around the world. So uh, the talk is called Algorithms of Suspicion and the Erosion of Worker Rights. And this project comes out of and is kind of in support of the organizing efforts of Amazon Mechanical Turk workers who organize as part of the Tricopticon project of, you know, as they're working towards better work conditions, some of what I'm presenting is coming out of problems that they're facing and problems that they're trying to present solutions to that um, we can support them in pursuing. So thank you very much. Um, so to get started, I'm gonna give an overview of uh, first the wider conversation about uh, platform workers getting fired by algorithms. And then in this wider context, then I'm gonna zoom into Amazon Mechanical Turk as a platform and the ways that uh, you know, employers, engineers, uh, people more broadly talk about the difference between good workers and bad actors on that platform. Uh, and then I'm gonna go through patents, uh, stories from workers themselves, uh, and also some research has been published to lay out what is it that makes workers suspect on Amazon Mechanical Turk? How is the quality of their work understood and how, is their, how, how are their qualities as workers understood? Um, and then I'm going to wrap up by arguing that there's a kind of quasi-criminalization of workers uh, that justifies eroding rights that they would enjoy as workers or data subjects. So with that, I'd like to talk about getting fired by an app Getting fired by an app is actually something that uh, in California and the United States where I am based, uh, Rideshare Drivers United is an amazing grassroots organization of uh, Lyft and Uber drivers that actually just launched a report with uh, Asian Americans Advancing Justice, a legal organization. Uh, and they've interviewed 800 drivers in California about their experiences of having their accounts um, deactivated is what it's called in Uber and Lyft lingo. So um, in this report, uh, they found that two thirds of the 817 drivers they surveyed had experienced deactivation. 
Uh, 30% of the time, they'd received no explanation from the company for losing access to their accounts. And 42% of the time, those uh, workers were deactivated due to customer complaints. Uh, and the customer complaints, like often workers complain that the platform just by default took the customer's side. Uh, maybe the customer gave them a low rating. Maybe the customer complained to the platform um, because they didn't want to pay for a ride. Um, uh, and there's you know, really no due process for these workers. So this is a, actually a, a really important campaign that Rideshare Drivers United is doing right now. If you want to go look it up online, get involved, sign their petition. Um, but coming closer to where I'm, you know, organizing with workers, um, Amazon also, you know, Amazon workers have also raised the alarm bells about this. So delivery workers for Amazon um, are often subcontracted. And uh, you know, Spencer Soper, a journalist for Bloomberg, um, wrote a story and uh, featuring one man who'd been delivering for Amazon for about a year. And uh, like the places that he would have to go, the packages that he would have to deliver are controlled by Amazon's app, even though he was subcontracted to another company. And one day he found that he'd been fired essentially because um, the algorithm said that, you know, the explanation he was given was that, you know, you're not meeting our performance metrics. These performance metrics are, you know, a staple of Amazon's in their warehouses and the delivery platforms. And he was not able to get appeal it. He was not able to get a response from Amazon. One of the things they talked about in the story is, you know, when you're out driving, you know, the app is routing you, the, you know, the, the managers of the company are setting what the performance metrics are, but, you know, they have, those managers and the app have no visibility into the contextual conditions of this apartment building has a gate and I was trying to get to the door and it took me a lot longer to do that. Or there were road repairs happening over here, right? This is like a foundational problem of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is making approximations and guesses based on maps of the world, but the world keeps changing and AI can't keep up and shouldn't keep up, I would argue. Um, but, you know, that um, context-free kind of, uh, that context-free way of making decisions, um, workers don't have sufficient recourse. So um, in the Amazon Mechanical Turk platform, you know, I heard through some of the workers organizing there about a story about a woman who was in the Eastern United States and she had lost, uh, she had like, been turkeying for a couple of years and she logged into her account one day and found herself with this message, your account has been suspended and there was no explanation given. Uh, her earnings that, you know, when she was working on the platform, you don't get your earnings every day. Like your earnings kind of build up and they get dispersed, you know, every two weeks or every month. Um, so her earnings were locked onto the platform. She couldn't log in and get those given to her. She couldn't get Amazon to respond. So she came to the organizers at Tricopticon uh, to see if they could help her push on this. And so Tricopticon workers had a contact within Amazon that contact agreed to look into it. And they came back a couple of weeks later and said, um, you know, we actually, uh, we, were sus we, su we suspended your account because uh, it seems like in your household, maybe there's like two Amazon Mechanical Turk accounts and they're using the same Wi-Fi network. So there was like some kind of algorithm that was looking to see if an account, you know, if like one IP address on, you know, for Wi-Fi had multiple accounts coming into it. And that's something that the algorithm was flagging. And so they had cut her off from her account. Now she lives in a house with her son and her son is also a trick worker. So I guess one question is like, why do we, you know, why do we think that um, Amazon would care if a worker, if, why do we think Amazon would care if there was a Wi-Fi network where there were two accounts on the same Wi-Fi network? Like that's, you know, how many of us co-work in cafes, right? Um, you know, why would this be a problem? Oh, yeah. Oh, because the oh, oh, I thought I had twitchy hands. Um, yeah, so they thought it was one person with two accounts, but there's actually another reason possibly that's not on screen. So I still got something. Um, so yeah, they, they, so they, they told the they told the worker that well for the social scientists who do research on this Amazon Mechanical Turk platform, like they put out surveys and they want to know that people are only doing you know that each each account is like a unique research subject. And so Amazon had algorithms that were on the lookout for people who might be kind of 
breaking the relation, this kind of um, this relationship that social science researchers were relying on of like one person equaling one account so that their research data's um, integrity could be preserved. Um, another reason that they did not, you know, a reason, something Amazon did not say, but I have seen talked about a lot in the kind of industry discourse around Amazon Mechanical Turk and crowdsourcing, and I'll get more deep into this uh, later in the talk, is that there's an assumption that workers in India are low quality workers and that those workers are, and I'll talk about like what, you know, what ends up counting as a low quality worker. There's, I think there's also like an assumption that, I think it's entirely possible that a machine learning model that was trained to kind of filter out um, Indian workers might have also noticed a correlation that those workers might tend to share Wi-Fi because they often are working in more collective settings. Like maybe there's um, a few people who have accounts and then multiple people are sharing them to make those accounts productive all the time. Um, part, of the, part of the problem is that we actually have no idea <laughs> how these algorithms um, are being trained, um, what models of good or good faith or bad faith work that they're depending on, and then what kinds of proxies for good or bad faith workers they're depending on to detect and suspend accounts. So that's kind of how um, I, I got concerned about this. And um, I just started, I just you know decided to go read what patents I could find that Amazon had filed for around issues like fraud detection, user authentication, judging worker quality. And so the data that this talk is based on is partly stories from workers and partly kind of reading these secondary documents, like listening to them talk at trade conferences about how they manage fraud, that kind of thing. So um, how many of you know what Amazon Mechanical Turk is? A few, oh wow, it's like maybe half, more than half people. Okay, I'm just gonna do a quick I'm going to do a quick explanation for the folks that are brand new to it. Um, and feel free to ask clarifying questions along the way if you feel completely lost. So um, Amazon Mechanical Turk is a gig work platform. So like Uber, like Lyft, you have um, a system that's a website. Uh, you have workers who are all over the world, but about half of them are from the United States. Maybe 20% are from India and the other um, 30, the other 10% are from other countries. Um, those workers are logging in from all over the world uh, to see what data processing tasks are available um, so that they can do it. Uh, the people who are putting data processing tasks onto this platform, the customers of this platform, the employers on this Amazon platform um, are often IT. Uh, they can be social science researchers who are putting up surveys. They can be um, you know, engineers who are trying to create data sets to train artificial intelligence. So they'll put, you know, pictures of visual surveillance and then ask people, ask the workers, you know, label the couches or label the cars or label the bicycles. So the kind of thing that we do when we do those recaptchas where we have to prove we're human by finding the motorcycles, um, that is the kind of thing that truckers get paid um, not a whole lot uh, to do. Um, you know, they might do like transcribing receipts. Uh, so some of my work, I've argued that um, Amazon Mechanical Turk workers, uh, part of their essential function is to compensate for the places where AI fails. So, you know, so sometimes receipt processing companies will send receipts that are too hard for the AI to read. They'll send them out to workers on Amazon Mechanical Turk platform. Um, but also the function, an essential function these workers play for artificial intelligence is like they're part of the ecology of labor that um, creates the human categorized data sets that train artificial intelligence. And um, because culture is always changing, because roads are always changing, the world that AI is trying to reference is always changing, these workers are always going to be necessary to keep recalibrating AI. But um, one of the design features of Amazon Mechanical Turk for engineers uh, that rely on it is that they get to, instead of, you know, instead of working in a firm where you've got a bunch of engineers and you've got data labeling workers and maybe they would meet at the printer or the coffee machine and have to actually talk to each other, um, instead you have, a, you know, a, this platform basically allows engineers or employers to access the workers through writing code. So there's basically two ways that engineers can kind of see the worker. Um, one way is by, you know, literally like um, 
writing computer code that makes calls to the Amazon Mechanical Turk application programming interface, where you can kind of set up your task and then you can set the price on it and then you can in integrate into your running code a uh, system that puts out work and then collects the results and disperses payment and kind of automates the evaluation of the work. Another way that's not visualized here, it's kind of the default way, is through um, basically spreadsheets. <laughs> you know, when you go into the platform, if you're a social science researcher doing a survey, or, you know, if you're just an engineer who wants to get a big batch of um, pictures processed, you know, you might see like, pages and pages of um, worker ID numbers, long worker ID numbers, no names, no places, um, no, you know, is this their main job or their second job or something they're doing, you know, for pocket change, just streams of ID numbers of the work, um, the worker ID and the work task that they did. So this is like a highly abstracting platform. It's not like Uber where you catch an Uber ride through the platform and then you sit with the driver for a while. So, um, so the purpose of Mechanical Turk then is to kind of provision the social cognition that people develop over their lifetime as workers, as participants in culture, as learners of languages, as people who learn how to like read a blurry receipt, as people who learn how to kind of listen to and transcribe like a bad English or Spanish recording. Uh, it, it basically creates a platform for allowing engineers to extract that um, in a, in a, and automate the extraction of that um, into AI and information technology supply chains. Um, and so a, a key feature of this platform is you have people who are trying to build the systems that provide intelligent answers or intelligent categorizations or intelligent behavior, but you also have a system where the people who are profiting from that do not want to make an investment in actually judging whether something is accurate or whether something is true. They don't want to invest in fact checkers. They don't want to pay, uh, you know, they don't want to invest in getting to know their workers and understanding whether the workers have the kind of knowledge to really like make accurate judgments about the questions the tasks are asking them to do. Um, and so uh, instead, there, there's various approaches I'm going to describe where managers try to kind of automate the process of judging which workers are trustworthy for providing these answers for the AI that's then being fed into our other systems. Um, this problem of figuring out how to trust people at, or at scale and keep out those you can't trust, uh, in Amazon Mechanical Turk world, borrows language from cybersecurity discourse. So uh, in cybersecurity discourse, you, know, you have people who manage large scale systems. I mean, here we have Ashwin who's kind of a world expert on this. So your feedback is very welcome. But um, you have people who are trying to maintain servers and model threat actors and then secure the servers um, you know, against quote, bad actors. Um, so you have a set of professionals who are used to talking about how to securitize systems against actors whose context or reasons for acting they cannot know. Um, and then in the world of Amazon Mechanical Turk, uh, it is common for employers uh, to, and actually Amazon itself to also talk about uh, people using these systems as potential you know, threats to task quality. So um, this top image here is from Amazon Mechanical Turk's kind of product blog. And they talk about updates they're making to maintain marketplace integrity, um, to ensure task quality and keep, uh, and to remove quote, bad actors from the marketplace. Uh, this image below is a screenshot of a political science publication where they are also concerned with characterizing, um, you know, how to deal with a large number of quote, bad actors that are on the platform. So both the Amazon as like the platform designer um, and the people who are employing workers through the Amazon platform are concerned with how do we know who to trust and who is a threat. Um, and this language of bad actors kind of marks um, and flattens <laughs> the lives of people like this woman who is sharing Wi-Fi in her house. So what is it that we can start to suss out about what makes workers suspect on Amazon Mechanical Turk. So I wanted to start our journey into the, the our journey into the black boxes um, by examining a very basic feature of Amazon's platform design, which is the worker approval rating. 
So when you're an employer going to the Amazon Mechanical Turk platform to set up a task, uh, you, know, you can like design your survey or you can design the web page that's going to like feed the images you want classified, you know, into that task. And then Amazon asks you what worker approval rating will this task be open to? So a worker approval rating is basically the percentage of tasks a worker has done that they have been paid for because Amazon's platform basically tells employers, Hey, if you put tasks on the platform and you don't like the results workers give you, you can just not pay for those results. So you do that by clicking disapprove. There's no process for having to show that those results that you're not paying for were the fault of the worker. Like if the employer designs a task in a confusing way, there's nothing that says that they have to like refine the design of the task to get better results from workers. It's just the platform basically enables the employer to unilaterally disapprove of a task and without due process, the worker doesn't get paid for that work and the worker's approval rating goes down. So one thing that can happen on the platform that Turkopticon is actually organizing a campaign against is something workers call mass rejections. So um, an employer might come onto the platform and have a huge number of tasks that they, you know, data, like images they want processed. Um, and maybe this is a new employer, doesn't have much of a reputation. Um, and so as workers go and work through the tasks, and then they wait to see, okay, is the employer going to pay for the tasks or not? Uh, a mass rejection is when an employer actually just decides not to pay for, you know, 90% of the work that workers did for them on that task. So like, a, so a company can just take all of the data that was processed and say, all of this I'm going to reject. And so then you get workers who are in their forums online on Reddit talking about like, we all got rejected. Like there was a company called AI insights that rejected you know, something like 99% of the task. They, they re, like, no workers were able to stand up and say, I got paid by them, right? So they're all figuring out that they all got rejected by this employer through their forum conversations. Um, and if you're a new worker, losing, uh, having that many disapprovals can actually tank your accounts. So, um, you know, if you're a worker who's worked on the platform for 10 years, maybe you've done 10,000 tasks and you someone well, I was saying maybe you might have done 100,000 tasks. So somebody rejecting, you know, 500 tasks might bring your approval rating down like half a percentage or something. And you can kind of survive that. You might have to do, um, yeah, you might have to do some tasks get to get your approval rating back up. But if you're a newer worker, a mass rejection can basically make your approval rating something like 20%, at which point no employer will give you work. So you're looking pretty horrified back there. And I feel like that's like the correct reaction. I, I feel like... you. You understand what's going on, I feel. <laughs> um, so Amazon Mechanical Turk, while the task of figuring out like, was it a task design problem? Was it a misunderstanding by the worker? Was the worker really just trying to phone it in? Well, that's complex. When one company rejects 90% of the work they get, that is less complex. And so that's something workers have been trying to get Amazon um, to develop mitigating policies around for the last year and a half. And Amazon, quite frankly, has been dragging their feet on it. Um, so this worker approval rating is like one part of Amazon's signal of who's a good quality worker. And as you can say, it's already kind of troubled from the start. Other ways that employers have of assessing um, the quality of the results for a task they put on the platform, I, have, I call them HITS. HITS is the Amazon term for human intelligence tasks. So if you see hit, we're not talking about assassins, we're talking about tasks. Um, one technique employers have, and Amazon also uses as I've, you know, as I, you know, from my readings of the patents is um, authentic, figuring out if the, authenticating the workers according to a gold standard. So, you know, um, like an engineer might have a pile of images they want labeled and they don't know what the right answers to those image labeling uh, tasks are, but they do have a data set of images where they do know what the right answers are. And so they mix those into the batch of work and then the workers who do well on the known answer tasks also become ones that they trust for the unknown answer tasks. Another, um, so we see a kind of attempt, you know, to figure out ways of automating trust here. Um, then the plurality is a technique where uh, employers, engineers put out the same task to, um, you, you ask three workers to label the exact same image, or you ask five workers to label the exact same image, 
And uh, you pick the most popular answer that you get from workers as the correct answer. So essentially, if you're, if you're a worker and your categorization of the image or your answer to the task is the hegemonic answer, um, you, you are judged as doing good faith work. And if you have a non-hegemonic answer, then you might uh, be seen as doing low quality work or making a mistake or a scammer, you might not get paid. Um, you might get entered into a database of bad faith workers an employer might keep or Amazon might keep. Uh, so, you know, if you have like three, three US uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk workers and a Canadian worker and they're asked to label, a, you know, whether something's like a, you know, what a certain object in a picture is and, you know, is it a couch or is it a Chesterfield? Like that's an example of a kind of thing where the person who doesn't give the hegemonic answer might just be judged as a bad worker. Um, Another technique is what's called attention checks in um, the way engineers talk about this. So you, you know, when you give a, a worker, say, the data labeling task, you also ask, you kind of put a question in there that, um, you know, is something like, you know, what is like two plus five, uh, you know, or so, something that sort of checks to see whether someone's giving random answers. You, you ask a question that you know the answer to to check to see if workers are just clicking random answers to get money or if they're actually paying attention. So if they check, if they get the attention check question right, then um, then you, you know, you as an employer might, might trust them more. Um, and then there's a kind of cost benefit analysis that engineers will talk about where, you know, if you want to have more certainty that the task result, the task answers you're getting from workers are correct and correct here because their training for AI would just be categorized in a way that most of our customers that we care about would think are correct or maybe the engineers who are evaluating how the demo or the final product works think feel is correct. Um, you, know, you, you give give the task to more workers so you can check to how stable the kind of um, agreement is on like what the correct judgment is. Um, but the more the more workers you assign the same task, the more expensive it is to actually process that data. And so engineers will kind of almost talk about it like, uh, you know, like a slide, like a slider or a certainty knob or something, where because they're trying to spend less, they're trying to spend as little money as they can <laughs> to produce as much um, AI that they can get away with selling as they can. Um, so that's part of the equation too, um, trying to get more certainty. Uh, takes money um, because it takes workers time. So if that's how um, the tasks are being judged uh, in a kind of semi-automated way by the engineers who put tens of thousands of these onto the platform in one shot, then um, the next step in the building block for my reading of patents and the trade literature is um, assessing the worker themselves in part by using so you're using the approval rating that we talked about is one way of assessing the worker, but there's other mechanisms as well. Um, Amazon has had for a long time something called qualification tests. So um, an employer can say, I only want workers who have taken this a qualification test uh, to be able to do my tasks. And so Amazon provides some default ones like a photo classification test. Um, you know, there might, some companies will have like a transcription qualification test. So workers don't get paid for the time they spend taking these qualification tests. But once they're qualified, then they enter a kind of pool of people who have access to the task um, that, uh, yeah, that require that particular test. So um, that's one way. Amazon also has something called the master's designation for some workers, where uh, workers will just kind of out of the blue, you know, log in and all of a sudden find out they're like, congratulations, like you have been anointed a master's worker. Um, what it, mass, Amazon advertises master's workers as workers that are kind of have done the best quality work on the platform. They don't say how they actually judge that. So there are workers online who try to share notes you know, and say, you know, and they'll say like, okay, well, I've got 99.9% .9 approval rating and I've done 30,000 tasks, but I've you know, not gotten the master's designation. But another worker who's done a thousand tasks and has like a 99.9% .9 approval rating has gotten it. Um, so there's some patents that kind of give hints at the way Amazon might be scanning workers on the platform um, to designate them as masters. And it maybe suggests that Amazon places tasks 
into the pool of work that workers can do and perhaps um, those you know, workers who are lucky enough to stumble upon these tasks are the ones that kind of get, you know, Amazon then marks as the ones that they, um, that they're gonna designate as like more trusted masters. Um, but there's consequences for workers of not being designated a master. So when you, uh, for when employers go onto the platform to design the task that they want done, they have uh, the default, um, you know, where they set the approval rating, Amazon also checks a default box um, and opts them into only using the master's worker pool because I think Amazon wants to have kind of neophyte employers like have a good experience on the platform. And so they just kind of, so, so Amazon basically feeds a lot of work onto um, these higher quality, you know, these putatively like higher quality workers. Um, of course, sending a bunch of brand new employers who don't know what they're doing to these longstanding workers is also possibly a recipe for pain for those workers. And um, that's not really something that as we see with the mass rejections campaign, Amazon does not take a lot of responsibility for the effects of workers, uh, sorry, does not take a lot of responsibility for employers' mistakes and how they harm workers. And so there's master's designation is one way that Amazon sort of has, uh, you know, when one patent it indicates it might have a trust score for certain workers that it keeps behind the scenes. Um, and then you know, we've referenced this already with the Wi-Fi story that there's machine learning for risk monitoring. Um, for fraud detection that uh, some of their patents talk about. So in one example, uh, and I'm gonna go forward to show you. So in one example of this patent, uh, this is actually not a patent for an Amazon Mechanical Turk specific thing. This is a patent about authentication and fraud detection based on user behavior. But I know from talking to engineers who worked at Amazon that the fraud detection algorithms that get developed in one part of the company also get reused across the company. So in this patent, um, what the engineers are describing is, um, you know, what happens when you log into an Amazon system? And so what could happen is when you log into an Amazon system, Amazon keeps a profile of your user behaviors. Like what do you, what objects do you click on on the website? Which subsections of the site do you go to? How fast do you do it? What are the hard, you know, what are the various like hardware addresses on, you know, your devices? Um, maybe, you know, what are the font settings of your browser? You know, they call this like browser fingerprinting. What are the settings on your browser? So um, by amassing a kind of data profile of your behaviors and your settings, then if the idea is that if somebody else tries to log into your account, that they can, the you know, machine learning algorithm will like notice that there's something different about this pattern of user behavior, device fingerprinting, um, and that you, that login should be challenged with a CAPTCHA or a phone call or like, you know, um, two-factor authentication. You know, all that sounds great. Like I don't want people buying stuff on my Amazon Prime account. Um, but for, you know, for workers, you know, this could mean that if somebody has a variability of behavior that, you know, say they get repetitive stress injury from all the click work and they start actually accessing the browser in a different way, they start using the tab key more, or they start accessing it, you know, slower, so the time signatures are different. Like that variability of pattern, and this is where my talk gets very speculative because I'm just trying to read the paths and think about what the effects of these suspicion uh, this, uh, this, these kinds of mechanisms could be, like, could that be the kind of thing that would be flagged and lock a worker out of their account? Um, and it, the other thing that's interesting to me about this, or problematic to me about this, is the way that there's an expansiveness of data collection that is justified in the name of performing fraud detection. Um, and so, this, you know, the system is tracking the kinds of data that it can easily access, but collecting it quite expansively instead of trying to design a system that maybe gets at more what are the workplace system design problems that are specific to this context that would actually um, make people better able to, uh, may maybe make the managers of the system better able to actually detect bad faith work efforts. So um, there's a story that, uh, for me, I think illustrates there's, that there's also a racialized dimension to what comes to count as fraud among employers and among the platforms. So uh, as anyone, so for those of you who know about Amazon Mechanical Turk, has anyone heard of the bot scare of 2018? <laughs> okay, so in 2018, there was this uh, psycho psychology researcher who made a, um, 
who made a discovery that, you know, he was looking at the results of his psychology experimental task and he was like, okay, they're getting like a lot of bad results here. And then he started looking at the IP addresses from where, where the um, work that was giving him bad results was coming from. And he was seeing that the work was only coming from certain IP addresses, like if, uh, that there were these like clusterings. Uh, and so he started to get really suspicious that um, you know there's a lot of workers who are using shared IPs. He started asking other social science researchers if they're seeing that. Um, and so kind of all across the internet, there was like a moral panic about all these fraudulent workers who are you know in click farms. Like people filled in the image. Like there's fraudulent workers in click farms where they're all on the same IP address and they're doing low quality work. Um, now you can have a shared IP address because of the way your ISP is set up, or maybe because you're using a VPN to you know mask your pri uh, to have privacy. Um, but so then there was a couple of researchers who started trying to un understand. Okay, like. Are, so it was called a bot scare because um, one of the stories was that these workers in the click farms were also maybe using just automated scripts to provide answers rather than applying their actual human judgment. But the kind, yeah. so uh, some of the crowd research was one company that did a study that I found very um, illuminating, kind of maybe reading against the grain of it a little bit. So what crowd research, crowd research wanted to figure out um, are these bots? Are these really automated answers? Are they um, people that might not understand the answers to the questions that are being asked or something else? So they designed a task that had a bunch of different kinds of questions on it. Um, so, you know, one of the tasks, one of the questions in the task that they put out onto the platform was a CAPTCHA. So, you know, we know what CAPTCHAs are. And so they actually figured out that there are very few automated scripts being used. The people were very successful at answering the CAPTCHA questions across the board. Um, and then they asked a set of questions like, you know, uh, you know, transcribe this piece of audio, the kinds of things you would see on the platform. And they did find that there was a kind of difference. There, there were like wide variations in like the quality of how people did those tasks. Um, and the people who seemed to make more mistakes at those kinds of transcription tasks and categorization tasks were people who were either non-US workers by their IP address or were using VPN. Um, but there was one question that the people who are putatively low quality workers, the people who are making more mistakes, actually did better on than the people who are putatively the high quality workers making less mistakes on most of the questions. So they had one question that was, um, which mountain is higher, Mount Kilimanjaro or Mount Everest? And so the putatively low quality and non-US workers actually did much better on that task than the more US-based workers. So the conclusion that the so like the conclusion that I want to emphasize here is that when people when workers get cast as fraudsters or bots or scammers, there's a racialized discourse about what knowledge is presumed to be valuable or what knowledge is even presumed to just be thinkable as knowledge. Um, and workers who know many different things that are not being given work or training, you know, they're not being given work that is, you know, meaningfully actually um, allows them to use those skills. Um, they're not being identified as having those skills. Um, the, you know, those workers are being cast as fraudulent or criminal in some way. Um, and engineers and Amazon's preoccupation is primarily with de developing machine learning systems to make sure that they're not going to be masters. They're not, maybe they're going to get their account suspended if their you know approval ratings go down too much, or they're sharing their Wi-Fi or whatnot. Um, and we see this in the kind of literature. Um, a lot of the literature that came up after the bot scare was about like, well, you know, you can get rid of a lot of these problematic workers by just getting rid of workers who are using VPNs. Workers in non-US countries often use VPNs because they know that there's a racial bias against them in this marketplace. So they use VPNs to mask the fact they're from India so they can try to do the work. Um, and so now these employers are like, oh, like we can look at VPN usage as a proxy for the workers that are trying to you know, access the work that we're you know, uh, trying to block them from doing. So, so I, I wanted to share this with you because I think that there's a, you know, there's a racialized slipperiness about how workplace design becomes, uh, problems in work, workplace design become cast as the fault of the people who are most um, shut out because of it. 
So um, keeping, you know, I think what, part of what I'm also trying to present here is this kind of ecology of tacit prohibitions that are happening through algorithms, through emergent techniques by employers um, as they try to characterize who these bad actors are and how to keep them out. Um, so the Tricopticon project, uh, the workers actually um, have a form to when workers have had their accounts suspended and they say, okay, you know, if you want us to go push on Amazon, fill out this intake form. And then the form kind of becomes this indicator of how you know some of the tacit prohibitions that are becoming visible as workers are contesting some of these so questions that um questions that the workers are supposed to um uh, kind of think about when they're saying hey i want to push back on amazon is you know have you traveled outside the country where your mturk account was registered and signed in. So workers are finding that, so I live in San Diego. I live 25 minutes from Tijuana, Mexico. Housing is incredibly expensive where I live. And so a lot of people who work in San Diego or had been living in San Diego are moving across the border to Tijuana. So they're gonna have an IP address that's gonna be changing countries. <laughs> So that's the kind of situation that could flag this prohibition on, oh, you know, Amazon is going to, Amazon's algorithms are going to think your account is fraudulent if you are mobile. Um, frankly, you know, there's probably a whole ocean of somebody who does refugee studies who could do a lot with that. Um, you know, are you on a network where others could be on the same Wi-Fi while you're working? Um, does anyone else in your household work on MTurk? Do you use a VPN to access MTurk? Have you connect, uh, so, so we've already talked about stories that explain some of how these kinds of issues come up. Um, so, uh, but currently there's no, there's no actual process, you know, uh, sometimes when Tricopticon workers submit these submissions, it basically goes into Amazon's black hole once in a while, like with the mom on the shared Wi-Fi, Amazon admits that it made the mistake. Amazon does not pay for the lost wages when it, it does admit that it made the mistake, but often it goes into a black hole and Amazon says that it won't share information with worker organizers because of their privacy policies, respecting the privacy of the user, the worker who actually asked the worker organizers to get involved. So they don't have um, a formal, there's no formal recognition that workers need to actually be able to share information together to kind of um, push for being treated better. So I've kind of been describing this like, the stack, this ecology of techniques. Um, but one thing that ter terrifies me, and perhaps it might terrify you as well, is that um, Amazon's never satisfied to take a technique it uses on one project and then just like let it be for that project. Inside of the company, um, they have a practice of, you know, if a project develops some kind of tool or system, there's a, you know, there's a kind of corporate value around making that tool or system available to people in other parts of the organization. So Amazon Mechanical Turk is an example of that actually. Um, and then there's also a value placed on taking the tool or system you develop for internal use and figuring out if you can turn them into products externally and make them into a platform web service. So Amazon actually has a product called Amazon Fraud Detector. And uh, it, so basically, if you're running a website, like a bank website, a hospital website, an educational website, um, you know, a government services website, Amazon would love for you to use Amazon Web Services login system, authentication system that has all these algorithms, some of these algorithms we've been talking about behind it. And um, when they are when they are responsible for logins across so many websites, they're also aggregating the data that they gather from the users of all those websites to build these profiles to then enhance their fraud detection capabilities. So, at this uh, Amazon kind of you know launch event, a uh, product manager from Amazon Fraud Prevention says. We're taking patterns from repeated bad actors so that you're benefiting not just from what you know, but from what we know. So there, so this methodology of um, kind of creating safety uh, is being uh, now made available uh, across websites and data is being also collected across websites. So we have a problem. Um, so I wanted to wrap it up by talking about this as a kind of quasi-criminalization and uh, pointing to some of the places I see in emerging data rights regimes as um, if, you know, wor workers who are quasi-criminalized in this way actually losing access to rights they might otherwise have. Um, so what we've been talking about is that fraud is both a cultural category and a legal category. Um, 
under the law, fraud actually requires, I believe, I'm told by lawyers, uh, criminal intent to defraud, but we're not, you know, that's obviously not, you know, fraud is being used as a cultural category in these technical systems. Like engineers are talking about bad actors, they're talking about fraud detection, but it's not, but they're not doing the work to establish that intent exists, right? Um, and we've been seeing stories about the, the penalization of people um, sharing infrastructure like Wi-Fi. Um, something I haven't talked about very much is the sharing of accounts. So in India, it's very difficult for workers to get Amazon Mechanical Turk accounts in India, partly because of the way that I think Indian workers' knowledge gets um, you know, devalued, made invisible in the ways that we've been talking about with the bot scare. And so then because workers can't get accounts, accounts become incredibly valuable kind of like taxi medallions used to be. And so the people who do have accounts sometimes then have multiple people working on the account to keep it productive and keep it earning. Um, and so then Amazon responds by um, can, you know, saying that sharing accounts is a violation of terms of service. And uh, then you know, those workers get suspended. So we have this kind of cycle of criminalization. Um, there's a penalization we see in that user authentication patent of changes in behavior um, contra the flexibility that gig work platforms are supposed to offer. And there's a lack of compensation to workers for when platforms or employers make errors, misjudging the quality of the task or an er erroneous suspension. Um, and there's no procedural justice process um, for task errors, rejections, or suspensions. And we see this portability of these like reputation risk profiles being built and then being made portable across Amazon through the fraud detection platforms or beyond Amazon's walls. So just to respect that workers have been actively working on these issues and are themselves seeking some kind of redress, these are, you know, um, the Rideshare Drivers United, what they're asking for for the accounts, um, the, the, the account suspensions that they're facing is they're asking for um, the ability of worker advocates to access just cause for suspensions. Um, they're asking for a way for having the company address bias against workers because uh, the rideshare drivers, I know we haven't been talking a lot about them, but one thing that's in common between the rideshare drivers and the Amazon Mechanical Turk workers is that there's a kind of, uh, there's a racism can influence the way that their work is assessed, you know, whether by a racist customer or by a racist employer who, you know, the kinds that um, don't recognize the kind of knowledge Indian workers have. So they want to see ways of addressing bias. And that's something Rideshare Drivers United has specifically asked for. Um, and the Rideshare Drivers United also articulates the need to remove an economic incentive that customers have for meritless complaints and rejections because they get to keep their money and they make a complaint. That last demand is actually over, overlaps a fair bit with what um, Amazon Mechanical Turk workers have been campaigning for, which is the ending of the harm of mass rejections. So they, you know, currently they have had a petition out for about a year. I, there's 2,500 signatures, but I'm sure at least like several hundreds of workers signed this because this is like the baseline of you know, workers disagree on a lot of things and it's really hard to organize a kind of united front in this kind of atomized, dispersed, internet-mediated workplace, but this is one thing they all agree on. Um, and they've, the workers have even suggested a mechanism to Amazon saying, hey, you know, it's fine if you want to let employers reject our work, but at least cap the impact that that rejection has on our approval rating. So if one employer decides they don't want to pay us, you know, we don't lose access to all the other work because of a bad requester. So you might think they could ask for more. I hope we see a world where they feel like they can ask for more. And this is what they're asking for right now. Um, as a tactical tool for workers organizing data rights, you know, so like labor rights have been difficult because workers are classified in these systems as independent contractors. Um, Rideshare drivers have had some success trying to organize for uh, employee recognition, but that's really, and then companies have responded by trying to get in the way of that. But um, data rights have been a tactical tool. Uh, like in Europe, Uber drivers were able to use GDPR to actually contest an algorithmic account suspension by arguing that there's an article of the GDPR that was violated because um, I think workers didn't have to do I think workers didn't have like you know, adequate transparency into why that automated decision was made. Um, but in, in the California where I live, um, where we have some of the str more stronger data rights in the United States, 
uh, as we've been trying to brainstorm like what workers might use to get more leverage to even um, starting to get due process around these decisions, um, we've mostly been seeing fraud um, fraud detection as a loophole to these data rights regimes. So California has a law, the marketplace, uh, it's like a marketplace sellers act that's meant to give the kinds of people who sell their labor on Mechanical Turk, that sell tchotchkes on eBay, people who are engaging platforms as marketplaces, rights, you know, if their account is suspended. So they can ask for data about you know, how that decision was made. But there's a loophole that says that companies do not have to actually provide, um, they do not have to provide the kind of transparency this law dictates if that transparency would hinder any uh, investigation or prevention of uh, deceptive, fraudulent, or illegal activity. Um, you know, so basically, like, there's this loophole where if a company, if Amazon says, oh, but we need to keep this data and we need to not show it to workers because it's fraud, you know, we already see that Amazon is like pervasively using that language to describe workers who are um, being misunderstood by the algorithms. The California Privacy Rights Act of 2020 um, also, you know, its initial version approved by the legislature basically provided a loophole where, you know, workers couldn't ask to see their data. Well, so workers are, platform users of very large companies are supposed to be able to see the data that um, companies have of the, on them and also request that it be deleted. Uh, and so this could include platforms that workers use, not even those that are designed for consumers. But the initial version basically had a loophole for companies um, to detect security incidents, protect against malicious, deceptive, fraudulent, or illegal activity, or prosecute those responsible. So basically it said that, you know, Companies are not required to comply with a consumer's request to delete in those cases. Um, the updates to this actually just harmonize the language with GDPR language. But GDPR language is that you know, security and integrity of the system, um, you know, when security and integrity of the system necessitate not deleting the customer's data or being transparent, then they don't have to do it. So, um, so part of the purpose of me kind of talking to people about this is to kind of get people who are thinking about consumer data rights and creating some of these emergent rights regimes that could be very important to workers using these platforms on the ground for them to recognize um, some of, you know, some of what happens when they allow the category of fraud as a criminalizing label to obscure struggles that are really over working conditions, that are really over organizational design questions. Um, so with that, I'm really excited for the discussion and I want to thank you and um, yeah, let's, and I'm looking forward to what I have to learn from the work that you've been doing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.